I thought we would take a few minutes to talk about a subject matter that has been, you know, on everybody's mind, and certainly a lot of attention has been drawn to it because of the athletes uh, that have come out discussing mental health. You know, their picture of themselves, how they fit into society, is it are they valuable? Um, have what they've done been accepted, et cetera, et cetera, and of course. The three or four top athletes always draw a lot of attention, and you know one of the first to come out was, was Michael Phelps, and and then Naomi Osaka, and you know Biles at the Olympic Games. Uh, but there's been a lot more. There's a there's a show on television. I think it's on HBO called Weight of Gold, and it talks to a lot of Olympic athletes that have gone through mental health issues. And I think there's a tie between mental health and self-visualization and the ability to see oneself in a new light, in a different light. Now, the reason I bring it up is because when I began coaching, was, which was in the 60s, mental health was never a discussion. You never talked about mental health. We didn't realize, or I didn't realize at the time, but there was a connection between motivation and mental health. If I motivated an athlete or an athlete was motivated, then he or she would have a better self-image, would raise their perspective of their own performance, their own place in society, et cetera, et cetera. Well, now with social, uh, you know, with the web um, and in this entire social contact that goes on in social media, um, we have this instant gratification information that's given to us almost immediately. And it's very clear when people have a blank canvas that they can take down some of those people that a lot of other people, you know, revel in and respect and admire. When I lived in Australia, there was a term for that. It was called the tall poppy syndrome. And what tall poppy syndrome meant was you have a field of poppies and they're all evenly, uh, they're all growing at an even rate. And every once in a while, a poppy will jump up and, and get a little higher, a little bit bigger. And in Australia, their first intent is, well, let's cut down that big poppy. <laughs> let's, let's cut it down to size. So we have two competing forces. You have these athletes that are doing spectacularly well. They're on a world stage. We place enormous high expectations on them. Uh, and then you have people that are jealous of those athletes, you know, that, that just simply feel like, you know, the athletes don't deserve certain things. Or if they don't live up to your expectations, we, we beat them up. So I'm going to go back to the beginning and say this. In the 60s, mental health was not a discussion, but I know it was an issue. And, and coaches dealt with it. I think the good coaches dealt with it by motivating athletes, which was a form of dealing with mental health, and this inspirational and aspirational activity that athletes go through. Well, now there is a, there seems to be a negative correlation between I'm not as tough as you think I am, or I have problems just like you do, and this great athlete, because our expectation is that they are super people, super men and super women. And nothing could be farther from the truth. They are genetically gifted, but in order to get to the level they want to get, they have to train really, really hard and make enormous sacrifices. And I don't think that the everyday spectator understands what's behind the curtain, okay? The Wizard of Oz got everybody's attention, said lots of things, and everybody bought in. But as soon as they pulled the curtain back, they realized that he was a fake, uh, in essence. And even though I don't think athletes that are great athletes are fakes, they go through the same exact pressures and problems that the everyday man and woman goes through. It's just that the platform they're on is so visible that there's this added pressure to perform at a high level all the time. I remember 1992, Sergei Bubka was the top pole vaulter in the world. And I had signed him to a contract with Nike. And in the Olympic Games of 92, which he was heavily favored, he didn't win. And Sergey and I met that night. 
And Sergey said, Coach, what do I say to the press the next day? And I said, well, I, I would say this. I mean, I, I would say that I'm not a robot. I'm not, a, I'm not just, you just don't turn me on and turn me off. And I perform at the same level every day. So the key in coaching and the key in raising children and the key in interactive activity between men and women and friends and lovers and mates, et cetera, et cetera, is this ability to cope with not only the physical actions that you have or reactions or interactions, but to cope with these psychological issues, to talk through the difficulties, to talk through the lack of, of assuredness, to talk through the issues of, am I good enough? Did I do enough work, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that today I'm happy, really happy that there's been attention to mental health. And even though I may not have known what I was doing as it relates to mental health in the 60s and 70s, I think we were fortunate in the sense that we we channeled this idea of self-image of of if I put in work, there's a commensurate return of you being a regular person with exceptional skills. And the attempt was to have athletes rise to a particular level without putting any additional pressure on them if you could avoid it. And even though at that time we didn't call it mental health, we called it something else. And what it was, again, was motivation, activation, inspiration, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm glad that we're looking behind the curtain now. I'm glad that we see athletes and we recognize as coaches and parents and people, we recognize that connectivity and friendship and achieving goals and all the other endeavors that we have in, in, in our hearts are not just physical activity, but they're psychological activity as well. And there has to be some form of compromise between the two in order to gain the level that you want to gain. So I am fascinated by the change in the way we look at things, because in the beginning, the way I can best sum this up is in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, for the most part, if your coach told you to do something or your parent, you would just say yes. And now people are asking the question, why? And if you can't answer the question why in regards to what your expectations are, it's hard to get that individual that you're coaching or teaching to see clearly what it is you're trying to accomplish. And what you're trying to accomplish should be a cooperative effort. So I'm happy about the emphasis placed on mental health and its place in athletic excellence.